Good morning, everybody. It's good to see you all and welcome you to Draminis. Um, if you're a visitor this morning and are here, it's lovely to have you with us as we meet for worship. A few things to mention by way of announcement. Um, first one, I'm going to start maybe at the tail end then. I'm leading worship this morning, but James is going to be opening up God's word for us. Um, and we're praying for you, James, as you do that with us. Um, we are, in the very best sense, cheering you on uh, as you come to open up God's word to us. We're praying for you, not only in your studies, but as you, you work with us and grow in those skills that God has already given you. Um, so it's great to have you doing that this morning, and we're grateful for it. Reminder that churches at 10 at Draminis were here this morning. That continues um, right throughout August, and Red Rock at 11.15. And I've said before, um, don't be afraid to pop up to Red Rock on a Sunday if you're later out of bed and you want to go up to Red Rock for 11.15. I promise you'll be made very, very welcome. Can I also say at this stage, if there is anything that you think I might have missed in the fortnight that I was off, don't be afraid to give me a shout. If you're the second person to tell me, that's super. Um, I, I always appreciate There's always something that's got missed, um, that somebody's been in hospital or something has happened. Um, don't be afraid to give me a wee shout and let me know, and then I can follow that up in the coming days. And then finally, the only other announcement um, at this stage is an update regarding our roof issues. The committee met during the week to consider the, the survey report that um, was done on our behalf regarding the various leaking issues. Um, that report has been really helpful in identifying some of the issues and problems that are the reason for us having water seeping in in different places. And so it's allowed committee to take the next steps to come up with a long-term solution. And we'll not be able to do that overnight. We'll not even be able to decide what the best option is immediately. Um, but we've been encouraged that the report is helpful and we will be um, meeting again and working out what the, the next step is. And we will update you um, when we've made good decisions on that. But we appreciate your prayers and appreciate your encouragement and support. Um, as I say to the committee and I say to all as a congregation, um, it's great and easy to, to cheer each other on and be encouraged when things are going well. In life, there are always little moments where things don't go, quite go as we want them to. Uh, and in those moments, our true colours come out. Um, and I'm deeply encouraged and thankful for our church committee and how they've been handling um, this particular matter. We're here for worship. And I want to read two or three verses from 2 Corinthians 4. It's one of my favorite Bible passages. And in verse 16 of 2 Corinthians 4, Paul writes this. He says, therefore, we do not lose heart. Though outwardly, we're wasting away. Inwardly, we're being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. So as we come to worship this morning, um, we can see each other, we can see a building, we can see a car park. In a while you'll see your lunch. But for this next while as we meet, by the help of the Holy Spirit, we fix our eyes on things that are not seen. And we know that physically we're wasting away. But inwardly, where Christ dwells by faith, we're being renewed and refreshed as we worship and we sit under God's word. And so we thank God um, for that privilege this morning. And we're going to sing um, of God's great love for us in Christ. Here is love vast as the ocean, loving kindness as the flood. When the Prince of Life, our ransom, shed for us his precious blood. Um, I've often said to you, and I, I, maybe it'll be a bit of a theme again in the winter, the gospel is not just for unbelievers. The gospel is for Christians. We need reminded again and again of God's grace and mercy for us and through us in Christ. Let's sing, Here is Love. <laughs>
Let's take our seats together. Isn't it an incredible reality that God, who is perfect and pure and just, can deal with us in mercy because of Jesus? That's the nature of his love. Let's turn to him in prayer. Let's pray. Father, we come once again this morning longing that by the Spirit you would enable us to see you for who you are. And so we come to worship you as the God who is sovereign. And we rest in that. Father, our ability to control the circumstances of our lives is so limited. And yet we worship a God who is in control of all things. Nothing takes you by surprise. And so we rest in the fact that not only in the big things of our world and its troubles, but in the small things of our lives and our worries, you're the God who's in control. And Lord, we rejoice in your great love. Father, we know again this morning that we don't deserve your love. It's not that we have earned your mercy, but at the very heart of your character, you're a God of compassion, a God who sympathizes with us in our weakness, a God who must be just, but longs to show mercy. And so, Father, we thank you for the cross, and we thank you for the eternal, the everlasting benefits and blessings of the gospel. Lord, this morning we remind ourselves that the lines have indeed fallen for us in pleasant places. Not just materially, with food to eat and roofs over our head and work to do. But Lord, in a gospel sense, we thank you that we've lived in a time and a place where your word has been preached, your truth has been heard by our ears and our hearts, and you've enabled us to trust you. And so Lord, this morning, we thank you for... A life in you, which is the best life now, with the best yet to come. Father, we thank you that there are pleasures at your right hand. There is joy that's yet up ahead. And so, Father, we pray this morning that you would enable us to lift our eyes off the things that are seen and to fix our eyes and our hearts on the things that are unseen. Father, we thank you this morning that you're patient with us as we grow in Christ's likeness, that you are merciful to us as we come and confess our sins, you've promised to forgive us. And Lord, I thank you that you're the Lord who has marked out each step for us before we move one foot forward. And so Lord, we pray this morning that as we listen to your word and meditate upon its truth, that you would shape us and change us into Christ's likeness for your glory, for it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Now, James is going to read to us from God's word whenever he's getting up to preach. So at this stage, um, boys and girls, come on up to the front, and I'm going to talk to you for a wee minute, um, wherever you are at. seeing one or two appearing eventually. Great. Come on ahead. If I shake my tub. <laughs> like water. Right, I need to take everything out of this bag first of all, guys. Right. So, um, what month is it? Is it September? No. What month is it? July, yeah, it's July. It's still holiday season. And do you know what I love doing when it comes holiday time? And I don't do this, but sometimes, here's my diary, and I go, don't have to worry about that, because I'm going on my holidays. And you should see the excitement um, in my house. There's some people think that the travelling and the packing is not part of the holiday, but I think it is part of the holiday. It's great fun. So I'm getting my sun cream, big smile. I'm getting my sunglasses, big smile. I'm getting my goggles, big smile. And I pack them all in, and I head off on my holidays, and it's great. And when it's starting, I'm smiling. And it's wonderful. And I just can't wait to go. And I enjoy it. And I want it to last forever. I would have loved to have stayed away on holidays, not just 10 days or 100 days. I could have stayed away for 1,000 days. Now, I might have got bored 
but I didn't want it to end. And you know when my face gets a bit sad? When you get home and you have to pack away the sun cream and you have to pack away the, and you go, that's it for another year. I love it when it starts and it's a bit sad when it's over. Here's another one. What's just started on TV? Has anybody, there's run, yeah, the Olympics, yeah. Anybody fancy running a race in the Olympics? No? Anybody a good runner? Some of you? Well, do you know what? I'll not run very fast, but I will love watching it. When the football came on, the Euros, I was, oh, when's the next match? When can I get in to see a game? And then it's all over, and I threw the, all the match program out yesterday, threw it in the bin, it's all over, sad. The Olympics will be good, and then it'll be over, and I'll be sad again because it's over. i, I tell you another one. Here's a picture. This is a fun picture. Who all do you think's in that picture? Do you recognize anybody? Yes, I did. I used to have black hair. <laughs> now, I'm there, and you see the rest of my family. That's my big family. Um, Mum and dad and my brothers and my sister and their family. That was taken, I think, about nine years ago. And they're all hopefully going to reappear in the next day or two, and I'll get to see them all again. And that'll be so much fun, and you can be so excited. But you know what? In a week, I'll be over. And I'll be sad faces, because we all have to go our own way again. And my nephew, Danny... He loves coming to visit, and then he's always a wee bit sad when it's all over. Why? Because we want things to last. We want the good things to last forever. But they don't. The holidays will finish. The sports tournament will be over. The family gather up while it's fun finishes. You can go back to school. But there is one thing that lasts forever in our song. There was a word, eternal. In my opening Bible reading, there was a word, eternal. James is going to get up in a minute or two and he's going to read a Bible passage and in it there's the word, eternal. Does anybody know what the word eternal means? Have you any idea? Eternity? Brilliant, Joshua. Forever. And God says, listen, when you trust me and when you begin to follow me, it's not only the most wonderful thing to know that your sins are forgiven and the most wonderful thing to know that God is with you all the time. But God says, out there in the future, in eternity, God says, listen, there are good things with me forever. And you don't have to think, oh, it'll all be over and that's it. God says, I have something for you and it lasts forever. Boys and girls, that's my excitement. That genuinely is my excitement. That knowing Jesus is something that is good and it gets better and better and better and it can never be taken away from me. There's lots of things can be taken away from you. There's lots of things that finish and they're over and it's sad and it makes you cry and it makes you cross. But God cannot be taken away from us and we cannot be taken away from him. It lasts forever. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that cool? Isn't that good? That's why I'm here this morning. I want to hear more and more and more and more about the love of God that lasts forever. And so, heart-shaped Harry Bowes to remind us of the love of God which lasts forever. If I can break my way in. Oh dear, what if I can't break my way into the box? This is a real problem. Great. Go for it. I feel like one of the elders of the communion Sunday. I'm going the whole way around church. <laughs> that might take a too long. Right, guys, um, we're going to sing together. And let me just check what we're going to sing before I say what we're going to sing. Um, Jesus loves me. Isn't that right? Brilliant. We're going to sing Jesus loves me, um, which, again, so precious. Jesus loves you today. He loves you tomorrow. He loves you forever. This lasts. This cannot be taken away from you. Let's stand as we sing.
back down round to mums and dads, whoever you're sitting with. I want to take a little minute, as we always do, to pray for other people. Um, there are a mountain of things that we could pray about this morning, um, but let me list one or two. First of all, at this point when we pray asking, it's also good to say thank you. And so um, already we've had three different people or groups away on mission trips, and we've prayed for their safety. Lucas's are back, and all look as if Africa has done them no harm in Senegal, which is great. We look forward to hearing more about it, guys, down the line. You have to tell us more, but we want to thank God for that. Hannah's back from Kenya, and again, I'm grateful that all went to plan. Linda asked me, was I worrying and praying every second of every day? I was worrying sometimes. I was praying a bit, but um, good to have Hannah back. And then Lucy um, is being lifted from, Lucy, Lucy's not here, so I'm pointing to where Lucy usually sits, <laughs> apparition of Lucy. Lucy is being lifted from the airport as we worship this morning um, on her way home from Uganda. Thank, we thank the Lord for all um, those comings and goings safely. Beth and Nathan head off from Red Rock next Sunday, but let's thank the Lord for safety as we've prayed for it. Can we pray for people to S's, sickness and sadness? Um, there are always folks going through health issues, maybe somebody you know, sickness, and sadness. You can't always see sadness in people's lives, but there are people, and we know there's sadness, we want to pray for them. Um, pray for Paris with the Olympics on. OM, um, Operation Mobilization, are, are doing uh, an outreach called Hashtag Fool, um, Life to the Fool, uh, and are engaging on the streets of Paris. Um, and yes, we can rant and rage uh, about all sorts of things that are not good. Let's not do that. Let's focus our hearts on praying for those who would share the gospel, maybe even Christian athletes, as they share their faith with others around them. Let's do that um, this morning, even as we pray for our world. Let's pray together. Father, thank you that um, we're part of something in Christ that is eternal, and Lord, something that is worthwhile. We know, Lord, that in life people chase after lots of things that are here today, gone tomorrow, and of no consequence in eternity. But Lord, we thank you for safely bringing the Lucases and Hannah and Lucy back from their, their various trips in Africa. We thank you, Lord, for the privilege of sharing in the faith with those who love you in other lands. And so we're reminded this morning of the work that's being done in those places. And we pray committing the Cuthberts, uh, and the folks um, in Kenya and the folks that Lucy has been with to your care and your wisdom. Father, we want to pray this morning for folks who are sick and folks who are sad. We pray for those in our local community who have been bereaved recently. We thank you, Lord, that you promise to journey through the valley of the shadow with us, that we might not fear evil. And so, Lord, we thank you for the privilege of coming alongside the brokenhearted. We pray for people today, Lord, who are sick, some in hospital, some in nursing homes, some recovering from surgery. Lord, might they know your presence, your touch, and the great sense that you're the God who never leaves us. And Lord, as we look out into our world, we pray for the Operation Mobilization Outreach teams in Paris during the Olympics. We pray, Father, for opportunities for faith to be shared, for the gospel to be heard, maybe even for individuals to put their trust in Christ and to take home the good news. Lord, help us in a world that, yes, is tainted by sin and sadness and trouble. Help us, Lord, to carry out your great commission to make Jesus known to the ends of the earth. So, Lord, we pray for James as he comes to open up your word and speak to us this morning. Might he know the help the Holy Spirit, and might we be fed and encouraged as we fix our eyes on the things that are unseen, for it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Thanks, James. Good to be with you all this morning. Uh, our reading is from Psalm 16. Uh, it's on page 549 of our Pew Bibles. 
Psalm 16. This is God's word. Keep me safe, O God, for in you I take refuge. I said to the Lord, you are my Lord. Apart from you, I have no good thing. As for the saints who are in the land, they are the glorious ones in whom is all my delight. The sorrows of those will increase who run after other gods. I will not pour out their libations of blood or take up their names on my lips. Lord, you have assigned me my portion and my cup. You have made my lot secure. The boundary lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Surely I have a a delightful inheritance. I will praise the Lord who counsels me. Even at night, my heart instructs me. I've set the Lord always before me. Because he is at my right hand, I shall not be shaken. Therefore my heart is glad, and my tongue rejoices. My body also will rest secure, because you will not abandon me to the grave, nor will you let your Holy One see decay. You have made known to me the path of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence, with eternal pleasures at your right hand. This is God's God's word. One of the questions that has plagued generations is this. What what does it take to be happy? I googled it and came across an NHS article uh, titled How to Be Happier. So here are the the six tips that the NHS give to to be happier. It said manage your stress levels, enjoy yourself, boost your self-esteem, have a healthy lifestyle, talk and share, and build resilience. I, I can help feel that these tips have just lacked a bit of depth. The, the article seems to lack the, the most fundamental problem and, and the context which gives a foundation for practicing any of these tips. Why do we all seek contentment, yet feel discontent? Why do we all seek happiness, yet feel uneasy? Why do we all long for unity, yet have disunity, even among those who are closest to us, those who are in our families, or those who are our friends? The fundamental problem is, is this, that, that we as sinful people live and participate in a fallen world. And joy is found in living in the presence of God. So the psalmist, he asks us to think, think deeper about happiness. When you read through the, this psalm, uh, you see lots of words like refuge or good or delight or pleasant or joy or rejoices or secure or pleasures and so on, words that, that, that paint a, a picture of, of happiness. Yet these words all describe his relationship with God, or his relationship with the people of God. God for him is his refuge and good, his allotted portion, his delightful inheritance, his consistent counselor and unshakable advocate. He is his security in in life and death, and he is his eternal joy. In other words, God is everything to David. God is everything he'll ever want, he'll ever need. He's not a good to chase after, but he is the source, he's the the fountain of all good. In verse 4 it says, those who run after other gods will suffer more and more. In other words, running after a, a, a multiplicity of God produces a multiplicity of burdens. Tim Keller wrote when co- this one commenting on, on verse 4, we, we may not believe in literal God beings of beauty, wealth, pleasure, or fertility, but we must all live for something. 
we may run tirelessly after our priorities or our ideals, but in the end, they will surely multiply our suffering if God, who is the source of goodness, is absent from them. Elon Musk is a fascinating character in this day and age. He's a person that many people look up to. He's a, he's a person of high intelligence and high creativity. He's doing incredible things that uh, people thought was, was impossible, yet he says this, that not many people would want to be me. And other celebrities have attested to this as well, where you know, you look at them and you think they have everything that you could ever want, yet they all say, well, not all, but a lot say, that they just feel empty. There's something missing in their life. Johnny Cash, at the end of his life and career, he, he, he wrote, you can have it all, my empire of dirt. Or the writer of Ecclesiastes, he wrote vanity of vanities, all is vanity. It's a vapor, it's smoke, it's passing. But David, he prays to the Lord and he says, you alone are my cup and my portion. God is everything for him and so David, he, he trusts he trusts God. He trusts him with, with all he is. Friends, the question this psalm challenges us with is, is this. What are you trusting in to give you joy and meaning? Is it your job or your education or intelligence or your family or your social status, your abilities, your, your money, your reputation? What are you putting your trust in? Is it a multiplicity of gods? Or is the one true God the source of all good? Is he the one who is your refuge, is your safety? Friends, when we trust God and pursue him alone, he becomes our portion, our counselor, our advocate, our security, and our joy. In other words, he becomes everything to us. I'll break this passage down into four very brief points. Uh, God alone is, is our refuge and good. He is our allotted portion and delightful inheritance. He is our consistent counselor and unshakable advocate. And he is our security in life and death and our eternal joy. So God alone is our refuge and good. The psalmist begins with a petition. Uh, Keep me safe. Oh God. And this, this petition is, is grounded in trust, for in you I take refuge. So David is he's in some trouble. It's hard to know what sort of trouble he's in, but he finds his safety in God. God is his safe place. Now, today, when we think of safe places, uh, we might think of places of affirmation, or places where we can go to, to to kind of hear the same thing back or to hear what we want back. But going to God's not quite like this. God's a, a safe place in a different way. We, we go to God because he is true, he is trustworthy, and he is good. So we might go to him, to his word, to receive his guidance, but we may not always like the things that we hear from him. Yet we can be sure that the things we hear from him are always always good for us. So we go to him for, for strength and encouragement. He is our refuge. When we are in trouble and we, we seek God, our, our refuge, we, we always go to him needy. You know, uh, there's countless times I, I, I begin my prayers with, oh, have mercy on me, O oh God, or, or oh, Lord, I'm in trouble and I need help. So many times I begin prayers like that. I go, we, we, go, we go to him, to him needy and we make pleas to him. But then as we remind ourselves of, of who God is and who God is for us, then we are filled with strength. We're filled with encouragement to, to go on trusting him. 
And that's what happens in this psalm. It, it, it moves from, keep me safe, O God, to verse 8. With him at my right hand, I will not be shaken. It's a statement of trust, a statement of confidence in God. In verse 2, the, the psalmist writes, I say to the Lord, or use the covenant name of God, name of God I, I, I say to Yahweh, you, you are my Lord. This is a declaration that, that he has no other sovereign than the one true God. And apart from the Lord, he has no good thing. God is the, the, the fountain of, of every blessing, the, the source of all good. Therefore, he is the source of all his good and all that he has that is good. In fact, there is, there is no good besides God. Everything that is good is only good because God is good. So the psalmist, he, he delights in the saints and the holy ones in the land. For God's goodness is in them. And God's goodness is displayed by them. He delights in the ones who have been transformed by God. Often when we see godliness and zeal of other Christians who clearly delight in, in God and unashamedly love Jesus, we can, we can judge them or we can look at them and think they're a bit strange. Or maybe we could even feel guilty because we don't quite measure up to, to them. So we can be put off spending time with, with these Christians. But the right response is, is to delight in them because, because their delight is, is in God. Christianity is not, it's not a competition because the church, the church is united in Christ. We, we all belong to him and we are all bound together by this common love, the, the, the love of his spirit. So when our brother or sister delights in God, we delight in them. A good friend will, will be delighted when things go well for you. And a bad friend will secretly burn when they see that you're doing well or when they see that you're happy and that they aren't. Be a good friend to those who delight in God. Moving to verse 4, as I said before, when we trust God and pursue him alone, he becomes everything to us. As, Christian, we, we, as Christians, we don't, we don't hedge our bets against God. In the world around the Old Testament, there were many, many gods. There were countless gods. And you would offer up sacrifices to these gods. Um, you would offer the sacrifices to, to keep them happy and to, to receive the benefits that they gave. And if you left out a god, then you may not receive their benefits. So you had to hedge your bets. But David, he says, he will not even take up their names on his lips. This was a statement of absolute trust in the one true God. Friends, we, we live at a time where we are told to hedge our bets. We are told not to commit too much to one thing. We are told not to put all your eggs in one basket, as the saying goes. Many people in this country, though, Sadly, they come along to church to hedge their bets. It's, they do it just, just in case. Just in case the Bible actually proves to be true and God actually is out there. So they can say they, they came along to church and they gave this amount of money. But in reality, they... We're serving Christ as if he was one of countless other gods, one of many gods. But the psalmist, he boldly proclaims that he, he belongs to God alone. He lives to serve God alone. God alone is his portion and his cup. He was all in. He, he wasn't going to hedge his bets, but he trusted in God alone. Friends, put your trust in God 
alone and when life doesn't go the way that you planned or when, when troubles come, seek Christ as your only refuge. Trust him with all of your life. Don't hedge your bet against God because he demands every fiber of your faith. And when we trust God and, and pursue him alone, he becomes our portion, our counselor, our advocate, our security, and our joy. So he is our allotted portion and delightful inheritance. The next few points will be a bit shorter. After refusing to, to give any attention to the false gods, he celebrates what the Lord is for him. The Lord is his allotted portion and cup. The Lord is his delightful inheritance. The, the language, it kind of reminds us of, of in Joshua when the land was being portioned out to the tribes of Israel. We talked about Joshua in our Holy Bible Club and we talked about the earlier part of Joshua. But the, after the conquest, the, the land was given out to the tribes of Israel. But in Deuteronomy 18, when, when Moses was instructing the Israelites... Uh, he says this about the priests and the Levites. He said, the Levitical, Le, the Levitical priests, indeed the whole tribe of Levi, are to have no inheritance among their fellow Israelites. They are to have no, no allotment or inheritance with Israel. They're, they shall have no inheritance among their fellow Israelites. That sounds pretty bad. But then, this, then, then Moses says this, the Lord says this, the Lord is their inheritance as he promised them. I think David, he's, he's speaking in the same vein here in this psalm. God himself is his portion. God himself is his cup. And God himself is his inheritance. And this, this lot, it's, it's, it's held by God. It's held firm and secure. The psalmist is so enraptured in the goodness of God. And what is true for David is true for us because of what Christ has done. He has brought us into a relationship with God where we call God our Father. And he calls us his children. We have a beautiful we have a delightful inheritance. We are heirs of God, co-heirs with Christ. We're God who is an infinite plenitude of beauty and goodness. He is our inheritance because of Christ. So God is our allotted portion and delightful inheritance. He is our consistent counselor and unshakable advocate. When we trust God and pursue him alone, he becomes our consistent counselor and our unshakable advocate. In verses 78, the psalmist moves from petition, declaring his trust in the Lord, to praise and confidence that the Lord will surely protect him. God is his counselor, his law is his instruction. We live in a time where there are lots of competing voices telling us different things. Wherever we go, we, whether we go to social media or to the mainstream media, there are lots of voices giving advice. It can be hard to know what to believe sometimes. We live at a time where any given decision has countless options. We are uh, in the process of moving house, we've just moved house a, a couple of weeks ago, moving a little closer to here, uh, and so we've been thinking about how to furnish the house, how do, how, how do we want the house to look, and so Rebecca advised me to download Pinterest, I don't know if you've ever downloaded Pinterest before, but I got Pinterest, and it works a bit like a virus, so you click on a picture, and it'll take you to the link. And then lots of pictures just like it appear. So I was thinking, oh, there's a nice, there's a lovely brown leather chair that I could see in my office. So I clicked into it. And then I saw the price, so I clicked out of it. And lo and behold, there was thousands 
of brown leather chairs that I could choose from. And I, oh great, there are thousands of chairs that I could have now. That's okay, I can deal with that choice. But in the bigger decisions of life, where there are countless options, it can be difficult, it can cause anxiety, or uh, it can cause problems. For a younger person who's thinking about what job to do, uh, and there's just an ever-growing stream of options, of careers, it can be very, very difficult to know where to go. But the Lord, he's our consistent counsellor. He guides us in life's most important decisions. He is our wisdom. He guides us by his word. He shows us the path of life. The psalmist says the Lord is continually before his eyes. With these competing voices all around us, the Lord is the one true voice to whom we can always depend, to whom we can always go. May we keep the Lord always before us so that we don't get distracted from his path. And the psalmist, he, he, can't be, he cannot be shaken because the Lord is at his right hand. It's almost a, a courtroom term or a term in, in battle. The Lord will defend David and protect him. The Lord will, will advocate for him. He will be faithful and, and loyal to him. And in Christ, he is all of this. For us, he's our advocate in court, and Satan tempts me to despair, tells me all the guilt within. Upward I look and see him there, who made an end to all my sin. Or as Romans 8, 31 says, if God is for us, who can be against us? Very quickly, and lastly, uh, he is our security in life and death, and our eternal joy. Uh, he is our Security in life and death and eternal joy. Recounting all that God is for him, David closes by rejoicing. He is so pleased, so happy that he knows God and that God is loyal to him. He is happy to the very core. He can't help but sing and rejoice for he knows that the greatest enemy which threatens to cut off all hope, the greatest enemy that threatens to cut off all laughter or happiness will be defeated course this is the death of Christ this is death is defeated in the death of Christ the apostle Peter who took up this psalm in Acts 2 he commented on it saying seeing what was to come he spoke of the resurrection of the Messiah that he was not abandoned to the realm of the dead nor did his body see decay God has raised this Jesus to life and we are all witnesses of it God did not abandon Christ in the grave. But the psalm points us to his glorious resurrection. He is our security in life because he is at our right side and we can rest secure. He has shown us that the path of life, he has shown us the path of life and we go with him on it. God fills us with, pre, pre, with his joy in his presence. His joy is overflowing in infinite abundance and we get to participate in it. We get to enjoy his endless perfections. But surely he will raise us up to be with Christ in our death, where we will experience eternal pleasures at his right hand forevermore. Pleasures everlasting from the source of goodness, blessing, and joy. If this isn't a reason to confidently trust in him alone, pursue him alone, and worship him alone, then I don't know what it is. Friends, think, think deeper about happiness. True happiness is found in the presence of God. And if we trust Christ and pursue him alone, God becomes everything to us. And he gives himself to us. Thank you very much.
James, thank you so, so much. Um, it'll get me going home to read that psalm and read it again. Do that maybe later on today and um, read the psalm and then some of the things that James has opened up for us um, will come back to us um, even as the day goes on. I'm going to finish as we sing together um, of this great God who is our, our treasure. Great is thy faithfulness, O God, my Father. I'm going to stand as we sing. <laughs> Thank you for the promise of strength for today and genuine bright hope for tomorrow. And so, Lord, today we pray that in the anticipation of a day when we rest in your presence, fully, completely set free from the things that plague us and pester us, Lord, today enable us in Christ to rest in your finished work, in your nearness, and in your promise that you watch over our coming and going now and forever. We pray that the grace of the Lord Jesus, the love of God and the fellowship of the Spirit would be ours today and forevermore.